Welcome to the Welsh Woodman Workshop and in tonight's video it's going to be aimed at beginner wood turners or people wanting to get into the wonderful craft of wood turning. So I'm going to be answering a lot of questions and hopefully those questions then will help you along the way in your turning journey. So the things we're going to be talking about tonight is what's the best way of getting started in wood turning, what are the different types of wood turning, what are the different parts of the lathe and how it works, Lathe choices then, so if you're looking at buying your own lathe, so some tips and tricks to, to look for. Uh, what sort of tools and equipment you might need to, to turn. And lastly, what projects should you start off with sort of to develop your skills as a turner. So I hope this comes in handy. Hope you enjoy. So wood turning is essentially taking a hand tool, feeding it into a spinning piece of wood and shaping it to a required shape. That's it in the simplest form. So we have two major styles. So we've got... Spindle turning, that tends to be where the block's between two centres. Uh, the direction of the grain tends to be in line with the bed of the lathe. Then we've got faceplate turning, which tends to be like things like bowls, platters, and the grain tends to be at 90 degrees to the lathe itself. There are a few exceptions, so like end grain bowls and such, but those are the two main differences. So we've had a quick look at the two different types of turning, so we're going to look at some of the features of a lathe now. So I've chosen to show you a smaller type lathe as most beginners will start off with something very similar to this because it's ideal for fitting inside those sheds and garages and also as soon as your skills develop then as well and you want to do some craft beers in the future these come in real handy because they're transportable and you can do some mini demos and things like that as you're selling your pieces. So the features of the lathe then. So normally on the left hand side, so I flip this round to make it easier for the camera is something known as the headstock and essentially what the headstock has is a spindle running through it and that spindle is driven by a motor and sometimes a series of gears or pulleys. Now on some lathes they have something called a spindle lock then at the, the front which will lock this spindle in place which makes it really handy for attaching face plates or chucks and things like that. In the, uh, the headstock then, you tend to put things in like driving spurs. So essentially this will drive the piece of wood round. And these all tend to have something called a Morse taper, so a little angle. So you'd need to find out the Morse taper of your lathe and buy a spur to the same Morse taper. That then you will be able to mount a piece between centres. So on the right hand side of the lathe normally, you've got something called a tailstock and we can advance this up and support pieces in between. They've got these little locking levers on the back so it's locked in place and won't be able to move. As a part of the tailstock then we've got something known as the quill. Now you can advance or attract the quill by winding this wheel at the back and on the quill themselves they have another locking lever so it's locked into place. In the centre then, we have something called a banjo, and again, it's got a locking lever, it tends to be like a cam or threaded lever, and as a part of the banjo, we've got something called the tool rest. Now, you can raise or lower the tool rest, depending on your piece. It's always a nice idea to put your tool on there and lower the tool rest so you're cutting along the, the centre line, as that makes it a little bit easier. So, putting a piece between centres then, so we can put that into our driving spur, some people would suggest knocking that in with a rubber mallet. Move our tailstock up then, lock that into place. We can advance the quill, that we get a nice tight grip, and we can lock that into place. And that's good for turning on then. So turning on the lathe, in this case, we've got an on-off switch here on the side. And this lathe has got a really, really handy feature and it's got variable speed. So we can increase the speed by using this little variable resistor there. I would highly suggest getting that if you if you can with a lathe because it's a great feature, safety feature built in. Always start your lathe off and lower and raise it up. You can do it with a series of gears or pulleys by putting it down to the lowest ratio, but you're going to want to spend a lot of time sort of changing those. So if you can get one of those to begin with, that's going to save you quite a bit of time and you're going to wish you had one if, if you got a lathe without one. Other features then. So... Sometimes you'll want to turn what's known as a tenant like this and grip onto it and an ideal piece of kit for that would be a scroll chuck. We've got this spur there, they normally come with a little knockout bar. We can put that through the end of the spindle which tends to be hollow. 
find the end, come back half an inch, little tap holding onto it, and we're good to change over. So these scroll checks then, they fit on the spindle. So if you wanted to buy one of these, you'd need to know the spindle diameter, first of all, and the pitch of the thread. So teeth per inch, so we can rotate that on. And this is where this little spindle lock comes in handy, as it locks the spindle in place. We can lock that down and do it ready to turn on. Now we can expand and contract the jaws by using a little chuck key. Clamp them down on this little tenant, just to show you. And then that can rotate round. So what's the best way of getting started in wood turning? So personally, I 100% recommend you joining a local wood turning club or guild as that's going to give you some amazing contacts. So wood turners on the whole tend to be really friendly people. Uh, we've often over each other's shops, so we're trying out different lathes and tools, which is going to be really useful for you if you consider buying something in the future. In fact, I got my first ever lathe second hand off someone in my wood turning club, and that's what really got me hooked and started with wood turning. So secondly, if you didn't have a, a club or a guild in your local area, you could try and find an experienced wood turner that wouldn't mind giving you some sort of an informal lessons as such and showing you how the lathe works. That's always really handy. Or even better than that would be to get a professional turner in your local area and take a few lessons with them if they, they teach. And that's going to help you to firstly turn in a safe way. And secondly, it's going to progress your skills really rapidly and it's going to save you a lot of time and money in the long run in not making so many mistakes to begin with. And if you're in the UK, I would 100% recommend registering with the Association of Wood Turners Great Britain as they give some superb advice to a range of different ages and abilities and they run some fantastic courses throughout the year. So as soon as you get seriously into wood turning, you're going to want to buy a lathe. Now what lathe you get will completely depend upon what sort of turning you would like to do. And that's why it's really important to have a go and try a few different lathes, a few different sort of turning styles before you make that initial investment in buying your own lathe. Now I'm going to show you a few things you can look out for, a few considerations, and hopefully that will help you then to make an informed decision along with your own research in getting a lathe that is right for you. So for example, if you just primarily wanted to turn pens, something like this would be ideal. Or if you wanted to turn larger pieces, a larger lathe may be more appropriate. So a few things I would look at when buying a lathe. The first thing I'd look at is the distance between the bed bars and the center, known as the swing of the lathe. If you times that by two, that's gonna give you your maximum sort of diameter of your piece that you can turn. Another thing I'd probably look at is the distance between centers, as that's gonna establish the longest piece that you can turn. The brilliant thing about some of these smaller lathes is you can buy these extension bars so you can go as long as you want between centers. Another thing to look at is the quality of the motor. So it's been engineered properly. Normally the higher the kilowatts or horsepower of the motor, normally the, the larger and, and bigger things you can drive without bogging down the lathe. Most lathes, like previously mentioned, will come with a series of gears or pulleys. You want something that you can easily access to change those out to different speed ratios. And that's why, in my opinion, the variable speed is such a great feature for number one, for safety, number two, for ease of use. On my old lathe, I used to have to stop halfway through projects, get a really, really fiddly opening cover to get in there to, to change the, 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 get the gears and the, and the pulley ratio over. So it's a nice feature to have. It's gonna make it quicker, easier and safer for you to use. So a, a cheaper way of buying a, a lathe would be to buy one second hand. Now there's some great deals out there on markets. A lot of the old lathes were definitely built to last and have several more years ahead of them. But if you were buying a second hand lathe, a few things that I would look out for. Uh, firstly, to make sure the, the spindle shaft is running nice and true. So essentially, if you're looking with your eye and there's no wobble to it, so if there's quite a big wobble, a bit like a cam as you're turning it around, I'd try and avoid that unless you've got some really good engineering skills that can straighten out that shaft. Another thing to look for is on the belts, or are the belts worn? Have they got splits in them, and cracks in them? Uh, well, they might need to be replaced. Whether the centers align perfectly, so as you advance them together, they, they meet together. Some, some lathes, lathes might be out of alignment, you might have to replace sort of bearings or washes in there to make sure they, they line up properly. 
Another thing to look for is how good are the bearings in the actual housing of the headstock. When, when it's turned on, is it a clunky noise or is it running smoothly? And uh, it's a good thing to look for maintenance as well in there. Is there a little grease nipple inside that you can grease the, the bearings to make them last longer? So the last sort of thing to take into consideration while buying the lathe is that as wood turners, we get sold a lot of things by wood turning companies. So you don't need the most expensive top of the range lathe out there to produce beautiful pieces of work. So I've seen people in Africa running spindles with their feet and turning with their hands while sitting down and producing awesome pieces of work. So it's the skill level that goes into turning that makes that work really impressive rather than just the lathe itself. When you come to buying your first set of tools, it can be quite intimidating because there's a plethora of tools out there. I remember my first time, but I'm gonna hopefully break it down to you to the six basic tools that you'll need to do 95% of all wood turning. Now I'm gonna make another video on how all these tools work. So if you hit the subscribe button down below there and the bell icon, that's gonna help you then get the next video when it comes out. So the first tool I'd recommend would be a roughing gouge. So you rough things out into the round really quickly with these tools. I've got a skew chisel, and this is for sort of rolling beads and doing lots of spindle work. Got a parting tool then for making those tenants or mortises in pieces so you can hold on with, with checks or passing things all the way off the lathe. I've got a spindle gouge for turning in those coves, beads, and any sort of decorative work on spindle turning. Uh, a scraper for that annoying grain you can sometimes come across. And last of all then, a bowl gouge for wood turning bowls. Now, when it comes to buying your own tools, there's a few things you need to consider. Firstly is the quality of the steel. I recommend getting a steel that's got a high carbon content. And what that essentially means is it's gonna keep an edge for longer. So something like high speed steel would really do a really good job. And you'll spend more time then at the lathe and less time at the grinder and sharpen up your tools. Now don't make the same mistake as I did when I first started out buying a, a set of really cheap wood turning tools from China. I think it was 14.99, it came with 12 tools and the, the steel quality was dreadful to be honest with you. I spent more time at the grinder than the lathe. And even on small spindle projects, those tools would start to bend and in some cases snap. So it's worth buying uh, quality tools. With wood turning, it's very much quality over quantity when it comes to tools. Now, there are some really good brands in the UK that I'd highly recommend. Uh, Hamlet, Henry Taylor, Crown, Ashley Isles, Robert Sorbet. They're all based in Sheffield uh, in England and they make some superb tools. Now I'm not sponsored by any of those companies so that's my own sort of personal unbiased opinion as such but it's worth buying a, a higher quality tool that's going to last you a lifetime rather than buying sort of cheap sets of tools. And there's another thing to think about because they are quite high priced is you can often get second hand tools and that's where wood turning clubs are really good because they, they look after you in sort of sorting you out with a, an old set of tools. Now a thing to consider as well is buying tools when you need them. You can see I've got quite a few tools in the background. A lot of them I've made myself as well for different jobs, but it's worth buying tools when you actually need them rather than buying these larger sets to begin with. And it'll save yourself a, a lot of money doing it that way. So a really important piece of kit that's often overlooked is the bench grinder. So you're gonna need to have some form of wheel or belt grinder to sharpen your tools. And it's safer to have sharper tools because you're not pushing so hard and things go wrong when you do that. And secondly, it's far more efficient at removing material and a, a more enjoyable experience. Now, I would suggest if you're starting out to get a sharpening jig of some sort, as that's going to give you, number one, repeatable grinds and consistent grinds, rather than grinding a different grind each time. As your body gets used to that grind, using it, and it's almost like muscle memory build up, and it becomes easier over time. Now there's far too much stuff to cover and this video is just getting long enough already but I'll make a separate video on how I made the sharpening jig and how I sharpen my tools and hopefully that'll be handy for you in the future. So as wood turning can be potentially dangerous we're going to need to have some safety equipment in place to limit that danger. So first of all eye protection. So it's essential a bare minimum that you have a pair of goggles. Now if you're in Britain try and make sure they reform to European standards 
so that they definitely can stop splinters and things coming off going towards your eye. Now it's always a good idea to keep a clean pair of goggles as well. So if you're using cellular sanding sealer, they can sometimes feel like braille. So make sure that they're nice and clean and you can see through them. The next upgrade from goggles then would be a face mask. Now I wouldn't be tempted to buy what's known as a splash guard, so one of these, as they will not take the impact resistance as you can, you can see there. So these are, are good for things like wood finishes, but they're not gonna give any sort of protection to your face uh, at all from an impact. A better option would be a proper face guard like this with the plastic trim around the outside, as that's really gonna take the impact. And just to show you, Absolutely fine. I have had pieces, unfortunately, in the past come off and try to hit me in the face, and this has been a, a godsend to, to sort of save me. Uh, definitely wouldn't work the same with this piece, so you need to bear that in mind. These ones are a tiny bit more expensive, but is it worth it to protect your face? The next thing we're going to have to think about is lung protection. So we're going to breathe in a lot of fine dust particles, especially with the sanding. So it's a good idea to have some form of extraction to suck those dust away. But we're always going to get sort of fine dust particles sort of building up in the air. Now a way we can limit those particles from going into our lungs is by wearing a dust mask. So you get these paper sort of dust masks at a minimum really uh, around your face. And I've used quite a few over the years. Um, I'd often find that the dust mask would clog up my goggles, so I got some built-in goggle ones as well. And better than those paper filters are these sort of HEPA filter type dust masks then. So they, they've got these external filters on the outside. They last a bit longer and they filter out finer dust. So essentially anything lower than five microns in dust, the, the cilia in our lungs, so the hair in our lungs can't block those. So that you're getting all that dust going into your lungs. And over a long exposure period, especially with these tropical hardwoods that some people turn, they're often carcinogenic, so cancer causing over a long period of time. So it's worth looking after your lungs. And I've upgraded to one of these. I get a lot of questions uh, about this. It's a JSP Power Active IP for impact resistance. So it's got a little lithium battery there on the, the outside. Impact resistant face shield again. And the great thing about this is that you can wear your glasses inside without it fogging up if you needed to. So we've got the built-in filters there. That really gives a nice cool circulation of air. We've got pre-filters that we can change out and sort of cartridge filters you can change out to prolong the, the, the life of this. And it's really light on your head as well. So it gives you, it's got a proper helmet resistance if a bigger piece did come off. And again, this has saved me a few times as well. So I'd 100% recommend investing in one of these. It is a big investment, but it's worth it in the long run to look after your eyes and lungs. Other things you need to consider is clothing. So roll your sleeves back. I'm terrible for that, to be honest. Or some people wear schmocks, jackets, just to keep things out of the way. But as long as you haven't got anything that could be entangled, loose clothing that could be entangled into the lathe. And the last thing then is your footwear. Try and wear sort of steel toe cap boots or, or rough leather boots that are going to stop any sort of impact if things do fall off or especially those skew chisels falling down to your feet. So no flip-flops. <laughs> so what sort of projects should you start off with to, to just sort of build up your wood turning skills? Now I would highly recommend starting out with spindle turning as that's going to make you a far more diverse turner in the long run and things like bowls and hollow forms are going to be a lot easier because you've developed that tool control with spindle work. And a lot of professional turners that are production turners will, will often recommend that as well. Uh, when, for example, Gary Rance, he's a fantastic production turner here in the UK. He's been wood turning ever since he was 16 professionally and he's close to retirement now. I asked him the question, what sort of projects would be best to develop beginner skills? And he recommended just mounting a block of pine between centres, rough it out, turn a load of coves and beads, rough that out, do the same process over and over and over again, as that's going to help build up tool control and muscle memory in using the tools. And if you think about it, musicians play scales to get that those skills into place when they need to play pieces. Uh, people in martial arts will do katas in slow motion and when they need those really quickly then that's able to, to just the muscle memories there and, and they can do it. So by doing some scales almost on the lathe 
it's going to help develop your skill. But I'm going to cover that more in depth in a future video. So if that sounds like something you'd be interested in, if you hit the subscribe button there and the bell icon, it'll notify you when that video comes out. So I hope tonight's video has been really helpful for you in sort of giving you a massive insight into how to get started into wood turning. If you have found it useful, please consider supporting me and subscribing to my channel by hitting the link below as that really helps me out in getting more videos like this your way. Over the next few weeks then, I'm going to be doing some more beginner style videos. So showing you what all the different tools do, how I sharpen them, how to make my, my sharpening jig. So if you're interested in that, if you hit the bell icon, it'll give you a notification when those videos come out. So thank you so much for watching. Hope you have a great night. Dielkenvaur, Norsta.